Welcome to Sunless Skies. If you're familiar with my playthrough of the previous game, Sunless Seas, then you're probably just as excited as I am. I played Sunless Seas for, well, according to Steam, 61 hours, and it was such an incredible game, and I loved it dearly. And if you're not aware, that playthrough ended with a very unfortunate accident where a bug in the game actually led to my death, and it was a game with permadeath. So that completely ended my 61 hour playthrough a bit prematurely. It was a sad end, but still I had so much fun playing it, it was an amazing game. Sunless Skies has been out in early access for a while now, but it just yesterday got a full release, which is what I've been waiting for. I want to make sure my first playthrough is the full experience, because I'm not going to be playing on permadeath this time, and I intend to get all the way through the game. If you're not familiar with my Sunless Seas playthrough and you've never played it or seen it, then my quick description would be it's... It and, and this game as well are both very similar in their construction and they're sort of like... Text adventure games crossed with resource management, crossed with a little bit of vehicular combat kind of stuff. But it leans very, very heavily on the story and the characters. And the writing is just so amazing. Anyway, um, yeah, let's jump into it with a new game. I've played for about 30 minutes, just trying to get a little bit used to the UI. A lot of it is pretty similar to Sunless Seas, but it has been years since I played that, so had to refresh myself, and of course there's a lot of new things as well. So, new game. Yes, you can choose to do a legacy campaign, which is the old permadeath. If you die, you can only continue with a new captain. Or, what I'm gonna do, merciful campaign, if you die, you can reload or continue with a new captain. Let's do that. Independent difficulty settings for aiming assistance, enemy projectile speed, and supply consumption. I'm going to leave these all on their default. The original Sunless Seas was very difficult, not just because of the permadeath, it was just difficult. So I'm guessing the defaults are going to be very difficult in this game as well. Log of Her Majesty's Locomotive, the Orpheon, March 14th, 1905. Our expedition to the domains of the dead has been eventful. The Orpheon is damaged and in grievous need of repairs and supplies. We are returning in haste to the Reach, where I hope to make port at New Winchester. May God be with us, for a thousand deaths wait in the sky. Final entry of Captain Amelia Charity Whitlock, DCM, written shortly before her death. So, our captain, who is going to die in just a little bit, as you saw from that message written shortly before her death, led us on a expedition, a failed expedition, to the Blue Kingdom through this transit relay here. I think all those sounds that we just heard when the screen was still dark was the sound of us coming through the transit relay. It sounded sort of like we were teleported here. And... I mean, if you look at this thing over here, it looks like it's sparking, looks like it's totally broken. There's a lot of strange symbols around here. This beginning is the prologue, and then once we get to New Winchester, we'll actually create our own captain. One thing I didn't try when I played before, though, is going back here and seeing if I can dock with the Blue Kingdom Transit Relay. Probably not. Oh. The Blue Kingdom Transit Relay. This is the transit relay to and from the Blue Kingdom, a distant region of heaven, still ruled by a sun. If you travel there, it is unwelcoming and uncanny. Thanks to the lack of traffic, many London officials consider this a cushy post. Those stationed here are in good favor with the department. Recall your recent arrival through the relay, and the frantic flight that preceded it or remain in the reach, you turn your engine around, you have business here yet. Okay, I did not do this before, this is really interesting, because I want to know why our captain took us to the Blue Kingdom. When I played the prologue before, they didn't say. Also, this is super interesting. So the Blue Kingdom is called that because 
it's still ruled by a sun. I mean, in sunless seas and in sunless skies, as the name suggests, they're, well, sunless. Strange, though, you'd think. A distant region, region of heaven with a sun, you'd think that sounds amazing, but it says it's unwelcoming and uncanny. It's a dangerous place. Huh. Alright, let's recall our recent arrival through the relay. A narrow escape. The Orphean recently arrived through the relay in a state of distress, having had to flee the Blue Kingdom. Whatever it was the captain did there, it incensed the local authorities. They pursued you to the relay and tried to close it while you were mid-passage. You barely made it out. What's more, the attempt to close the relay has damaged it. No travel will be possible in either direction until it is repaired. Yeah, so that's why it's all broken. Closed it while we were going through it. So we weren't chased out by a, a monster or anything like that. It was the local authorities inside of the Blue Kingdom. Okay, let's leave. You put the edifice behind you and head back towards the knotted, overgrown tangles of the Reach. Occasionally, stars peek through gaps in the celestial undergrowth. So, in Sunless Seas, we control the boat, and here we control a... Well... I mean, I guess it's technically a spaceship? March 16th, 1905. We have little food left now. Soon hunger will begin to bite. Yeah, I guess this is technically a spaceship, but it's styled really heavily after locomotives. March 17th. You have returned to the Reach, an untamed sunless span of the heavens. London's new frontier. A celestial garden run wild. Yeah, so we can control ourselves pretty similarly to how we did in Sunless Seas. There's a lot of momentum, you know, it takes a while to, to speed up and slow down. We can go back pretty slowly, we can go forwards much faster. Uh, and then there's also the dodge. That's new. I don't think that existed with the boats. March 17th. Your journey back from the Blue Kingdom was tumultuous. Your locomotive is crippled and Captain Whitlock badly wounded. Freaking love the music. March 18th. As first officer, the crew look to you. The nearest station is New Winchester. Can you get the Orphean there safely? Scavenge some supplies. Much to the relief of your stokers, you find a barrel of fuel among the detritus. Yeah, just like, sun just like Sunless Seas, you have fuel and you have supplies, both of which go down by, you know, if you move that uses your fuel, and I think... Yeah, these just go down by time. Like, even just just sitting here, it's being used up, because your crew has to eat and stuff. March 18th. A wreck drifts here, less fortunate than you. We should scavenge here, uh, her for repairs, a crewman suggests. The wreck of the Ozymandias. The wreck hangs in the sky, pocked with recent gunfire. You and the boarding party don your sky suits, garments of waxed canvas lined with felt to protect against the cold of the sky. Two of the crew are whispering as they dress. What business did Captain Whitlock have in the Blue Kingdom anyway? Why the devil did we trespass on the districts of the dead? You silence him. Now is not the time. Leap across to the wreck. The gap between the two engines isn't wide, but the endless fathoms of heaven gape beneath it. You jump. Your stomach lurches with vertigo as the stars blaze above you and below. The air of the heavens is thin, 
and torn by unpredictable winds. Then your boots hit the running board of the Ozymandias, and your leather-gloved hands fumble for a hold. One of your companions throws you a line, and you lash the two engines together. Only then do the rest of the boarding party follow you. One of them forces open an exterior hatch, and you clamber inside. Her interior is cold, unlit, and whistles with wind. Your party's lamps spread buttery light over the narrow, paneled passages. You make your way towards the hold, stepping over bodies crumpled in the corridor. Unfortunately, your way is blocked. A bulkhead has been mangled inwards by a well-aimed barrage. We can clear the obstruction away or lead your party on a more precarious path. Yeah, so clearing the obstruction takes Iron, basically strength, and taking a more precarious path, uses Veil. I'm going to use Veil. I'm not going to be a character that has a lot of iron. Go back out onto the Ozymandias' hole, climb past the blockage, and enter through a window on the far side. And do so carefully. And Veil's is the skill of deceiving and evading. The rest of the boarding party follow you without enthusiasm. <laughs> That's fair. You recall the first time you climbed outside an engine, helping the captain fix a leak in an exterior pipe. The wind had shrieked, buffeting at you. You asked the captain what would happen if you slipped. You fall, she answered, tersely. But where to? you asked. She looked down, then up, then back. The sky's depths spiraled all about you. Away, she said and you heard her fear. Back in the present, you stumble, tumble back into the Ozymandias through a shattered window. Your party spills in after you, glad to be back inside. You've reached the Ozymandias' hold, a ruin of smashed cargo and spilled supplies. Hopefully, somewhere amidst the detritus, you can find parts to repair the Orphean and restock your stores. Let's conduct a thorough search. Your companions work quickly, the Ozymandias' hull has begun to creak. Your actions on board may have compromised its integrity. You find enough food and gear to restock your supplies and enough spare parts to make necessary repairs to the Orphean. The food will need to be thoroughly thawed, of course, but you've eaten worse in the skies. Oh, cries one of your party, prying the lid off a long crate. It holds a cannon, still nestled in straw. Another crewman pulls a battered birdcage from a pile of ruined cargo. Within the cage, something winged and furred opens a sullen eye. You examine your finds. Gain 15 whole, so now we're up to max health, and plus 4 supplies. Which is good, because we had 0 extra before. Yeah, I think this number here is the number of unused supplies or fuel that you have, and then this bar is how used the current unit is. So you can have zero units of supplies, but still have, you know, a little bit of supplies being used up left. The Ozymandias emits a long, juddering creak. Your boarding party exchanges nervous glances. From the chaos of its hold, you've retrieved repairs and supplies and discovered some useful equipment. A gun that could be mounted on your locomotive and an educated bat. <laughs> I was so happy when I first saw that, an educated bat. Which means just about what you'd think it would mean. Uh, so we can actually do both things, we don't have to choose one or the other, so first let's mount the Jerusalem cannon on the Orphean. Her own weapons were damaged during your flight from the Blue Kingdom, that leaves you vulnerable. The Cotterall and Hathersage Jerusalem fires single shells to a good range, more or less accurately. You order two of your party to get it back to your vessel and fit it immediately. The Ozymandias groans again. The structure shudders spasmodically. Liberate a diffident bat and employ it as a scout. The heavens are wide, so locomotives use scouts, like bats, to locate things of interest ports, resources, wrecks like this one to scavenge. The bat treats its rescue as an inconvenience and immediately begins haggling over pay. You offer to put it back in its damn cage and leave it on the Ozymandias, at which point it becomes more polite. You doubt it will last. 
you now have one diffident bat. <laughs> I love this bat. It's haggling over pay. A bat haggling over pay. What does its voice sound like, I wonder? That's a cool bat. Okay, so at this point, we can either just return or try to press our luck a little bit and find more. You might find more fuel there, but you'd better hurry. The Ozymandias is beginning to tear apart. Let's do that. The wreck of the Ozymandias screeches as its metal buckles and tears. You press on through the shuddering corridors, searching frantically for the engine room. I can either send a smaller party ahead to retrieve fuel or go myself and conduct a hasty search. I feel... Okay, so this one uses hearts. This one uses mirrors. I feel like this the character that I'm going to be playing, which I know I haven't actually made the character yet. You'll see them pretty soon once we get to a port. But I feel like my character isn't the sort of person who would go on their own. The sort of person who would sacrifice themselves for the crew rather than doing the maybe more wise thing to do, which is, you know, send the the people that are a little, a little bit more expendable to go do the dangerous thing. But no, they would go themselves. Send the rest of the boarding party back to the Ozymandias. Go on alone. Ooh, failure. Okay, so that, that means that uh, these early things, even in the tutorial, are not predetermined to always be a success. Because I did this before when I was playing through the tutorial, and I was successful. So let's see what happened. The engine room is gray with spilled ash and littered with corpses. Little has survived the Ozymandias' ruin. You search fruitlessly for coal, but linger too long. As the wreck is racked with final violent tremors, you race back to the Orphean. With a dying groan, the Ozymandias splits in two, sending shards of splintered plating spinning into the sky. Several of them bite into the Orphean, mauling its hole. Stoking your engines, you steam away from the collapsing wreck. You are restocked, at least, and rearmed. Lost ten whole. Okay, now we're hurt again. Oh, right, and now we have this gun, so check this out. Yeah, it seems pretty accurate. Oof. I've actually never overheated before. Hope that didn't hurt my hole or anything. No, we're still at 20. Yeah, I can fire pretty fast, it's pretty accurate, but it does use a lot of, I guess, heat? Generates a lot of heat? Yeah, so firing generates heat, um, doing side dashes, dodges, also generates a little bit of heat. Press F to send out your scout. Costs, supplies. Okay. Go, bat! March 20th. Your scout reports a successful expedition. Yeah, these are just little tutorial things, so I'm just going to hide that for now. I'll ignore all the ones that I've already seen, and if anything new pops up, I'll check it out. So, what did they find? They found this. Your scout has discovered something. So it just kind of groups things into general categories when you haven't actually discovered them yet. So we know that there's a station over here. Yeah, check out how big this map is, by the way. This map is huge. And guess what? There's like four or five of them. This is the Reach. Here's Elitheria. Here's the Blue Kingdom. Where we just came from. Here's Albion. And then back to the Reach. This game is so big. Summoned by Captain Whitlock. The walls of the captain's cabin are lined with a hodgepodge of curios from across the sky. Captain Whitlock lies in bed. Black marks cover her skin like a monstrous brand. When she coughs, coils of acrid smoke pour from her lungs. Either approach the bedside or inquire after the captain's injuries. Uh, 
Well, we've been summoned by Captain Woodlock, right? So we should probably just approach. Let's stop for a second, though. Something really, really, really bad happened to Captain Whitlock, obviously. Black marks? Like a monstrous brand when she coughs coils of acrid smoke pour from her lungs? I mean, they didn't just get, like, burned or something, and now they're suffering the injuries. It sounds like something magical and horrible happened to them. Let's approach the bedside. Her mouth is blistered, blistered from the blue fires that dance on her tongue. Her hand grips your arm. Her skin is hot as a kettle. Made arrangements. <laughs> the Orphean will be yours. Her voice is just a rasp of burned meat breath. But promise. She breaks off to scream a word in a language that was not made for human mouths. When she resumes speaking English, she is weaker. Her request little more than a gasp. Promise me... One last service. Promise. I can promise her. Make no promise, pull away, or demand to know why she took the Orphean to the Blue Kingdom. I want to stop here for a second. Look at this description for the Blue Kingdom. It was folly to visit one of the lands of the dead. Now you are all paying the price. The lands of the dead, so the Blue Kingdom, this heaven with a sun, is a land of the dead? How bizarre is that? Also, what the hell happened to Whitlock? Whatever they did, I mean, she must have did something horrible before the authorities chased her out. There's no way that these wounds that she has are just from the authorities firing at our ship, right? Must have been something else. She must have been messing with something magical and terrible. Um, okay. Before I promised her I'll obey the last command, but I kind of, this time I kind of want to demand to know why she took the Orphean to the Blue Kingdom. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. She laughs, a sound like wood snapping on the fire. Ash sprays from her mouth. It was worth it, she swears. Her voice is suddenly firm, her eyes hard and bright. Then she sinks back into the scorched pillows and a twisting frantic fever. Yeah, like fire on her tongue, ash spraying from her mouth? What the fuck happened to her? And even with all this, she thinks it was worth it? What did she do? It was worth it, she swears. Uh, what happens if you choose the other option to say, yes, I'll do whatever your last order is, is the order is just be a better captain than I was. Take your leave. You have an engine to command. You leave the cabin and the scorched stink of its air behind, and return to the bridge. New Winchester is further than you'd like, and the captain hasn't long left. Onwards. Okay, combat. Gotta break through this stuff and then we can shoot it. Yeah, much like Sunless Seas, it's pretty difficult to control this vehicle, because there's a lot of momentum, it's not very fast to move. But hopefully they made the combat a bit more interesting than it was in Sunless Seas. In Sunless Seas it involved a lot of going in a circle and just like a lot of... There were a lot of tactics that you could use to cheese the enemies. Hopefully it's not like that here. Kind of using my light to aim. I can turn that off, by the way. Yes! So satisfying. You gotta really... Gotta, it's really hard to aim.
Ah. The Reach Marauder is defeated. You approach the buckled wreckage, poised to plunder the plunderers. Behind you, someone is humming a song of victory. Can I either strip it for repairs or raid the remains? Right, so like supplies or more whole. And at 20 out of 30. Hmm. When I get to New Winchester, I can repair my ship for a cost of one coin per hole damaged. So this is only going to cost 10 to repair. So I think supplies are a better bet. Raid the remains. Marauders pillage homesteads and hunt travelers all across the reach. They often carry stolen valuables. Ill got gains. Your boarding party returns with wallets and watches, cufflinks, lockets, and keepsakes. You store them in the safe to be pawned when, if, you make it back to port. 49 sovereigns. Where are we at on the map? Okay, so it's up here on the right. March 22nd, the taste of smog, the sound of iron on iron. We are home. New Winchester. A new port. The crew are eager to see what it has to offer. <laughs> That's so cool that you dock by actually going on to just like, I guess at this point, old school train tracks. Yeah, they've really so strongly kept that aesthetic. You coast into the bustle, the din, the soot, and the steam of Wolvesey Station. It's clogged with other engines. Scrappy mining locomotives from Lustrum Way, weathered explorers gleaming with frost, sleek company vessels with bright brass fittings. No sooner have you pulled into the sidings than a brusque station master bustles over. He requests to come aboard. I must speak with your captain, he insists, brandishing a ledger. The usual formalities. Look to the orphan's, orphan's doctor. He has just appeared at your shoulder. His face is solemn. His hat is in his hands. He lowers his eyes. The crew exchange bleak, wordless looks. The Orvian itself feels suddenly more empty. The station master looks confused. You inform him that, unfortunately, Captain Whitlock has just passed. Ah, he says, neutrally. Sorry to hear that. Very sad, very sad. He waits for what he considers an appropriate minute and a half before continuing. Alas, even amidst tragedy, the cogs of bureaucracy must turn. If Captain Whitlock is deceased, the station authority requires their answers from the first officer. He dons a set of spectacles and locates his pen. It will be relatively painless. Name, background, purpose of visit, etc. Shall we begin? Shall we begin? Yeah, looking for my details in this is when I create the captain. Oh yeah, so this was super interesting when I read this. Today, London lies between the stars. Her new empire unfolds across the heavens. But ten years ago, before the Northern Gate was opened, before the renewed Empress led her people into the skies, it lay in a vast cavern far beneath the earth. Deep, dark, marvelous. Who were you then? So, Ten years ago. It, so it sounds like it was just ten years ago that all of us, these people, I guess, used to be in the Sunless Sea. So this is an extension of that universe. This is the same universe, but just fast forward a bit of time. I love the idea that London is just this thing that keeps moving and could be anywhere. Right? Like before, London was in the Sunless Sea Cavern thing. Today, London is between the stars. Like, London really gets around, huh? And it says ten years ago, before the Northern Gate was opened, it lay in a vast cavern. So the Northern Gate being opened and the renewed Empress leading their people into the skies is what caused us to come here, I guess? 
The northern gate sounds vaguely familiar from Sunless Skies, but I don't remember it very well. Anyway, uh, we get to choose our captain's background, so there's six to choose from. Four, five, six, oh no, sorry, there's eight to choose from. And within each of these, there's like three sub selections. There's four main characteristics to your captain that are involved in things like skill checks. There's veils, that's the art of like deception, being stealthy, being careful. There's iron, which is like strength, determination, that sort of thing. There's heart, which is, well, it just says right there, the skill of convincing and enduring. And there's mirrors, the skill of investigating and deducing. So there's the four main skills and there's eight different like major types for the captain you can choose. So each of these four skills is shared by two of these different positions. So like, for example, you could be a soldier with ha which has high iron, or you could be a zailer with has which has high iron, or a priest with high hearts, or a poet with high hearts. Just looking at this one here, that that's zailer hat, <laughs> and just the kind of silly, but uh, it's grown on me term zailer. Reminds me of Sunless Seas. God, that was such a good game and such a good playthrough. So damn enjoyable. I feel nostalgic thinking about it and thinking about my captain. In case you didn't know, um, for that playthrough, I played as Captain Abner Marsh, which is named after the captain of a steamboat in the novel Fever Dream, written by George R. R. Martin, long before they did the Game of Thrones stuff. Yeah, Captain Abner Marsh. He did really damn well. They went so damn far. For this character, though, I'm gonna play a revolutionary. The world is broken. One way for the rich, another for the poor. You decided to do something about it. This feels particularly appropriate because of where I'm at, just personally, with events in the world, and you know how conscious I am of what's happening in the world and why it's happening, this feels appropriate. So this is going to basically make my main skill, my highest starting skill, is going to be Veils, the skill of evading and deceiving. Which, I just want to compare this, by the way, it's, it's kind of interesting to think of these two different um, captain types that give you the same skill, right? A street urchin will give me Veils, but also a revolutionary will do it too. It's kind of interesting to think the different paths that these sorts of people took to gain their skills. Like a street urchin, no parents, no laws, no masters, but also no roof over your head, no money, and often no dinner. Freedom comes at a price. So, like, they look like a cut purse, right? They're literally cutting a purse in that picture there. So they gained their skills of evading and deceiving just to survive, right? They grew up with nothing. They had to do some kind of dirty, underhanded stuff just to live. So that's how they gained their their veil skill. But a revolutionary gained it through something else. It depends what I pick for the sub-skill. But, you know, when moving within a world that is heavily stacked in the favor of the rich, and you're trying to expose the, the, the crimes and the immoral actions of all of these incredibly powerful groups, you're gonna need probably some pretty good evasion and maybe deceiving skills, right? I just thought that was interesting. Okay, so we get to choose how we were a revolutionary. With your fist, uh, with your feet and your fists, with your mind or with your art. So this is your sub skill, it's the one that you're gonna have another boost to, but it's not gonna be quite as high as your main skill, which is veils. This is iron, this is mirrors, this is hearts. Uh, I'm going to go with with your mind. Lies are the tools of tyrants. You published research to expose those lies and illuminate injustice. Yeah, so this gives us mere skill and also affiliates us with uh, academic people and groups. Yeah, so I'm sort of like a journalist, professor, educator of some sort. Choose an ambition. What does winning mean to you? Wealth, fame, or the truth? Okay, wealth to me is super boring. Not interested in that in the slightest. The truth sounded great. Uh, let's read it, but there's a reason that I don't think I'll go with it. 
Even the stars have secrets, but they won't keep them from you. A message for an old friend begins an unwise quest to learn a secret that the stars hide. What drives you? Curiosity? Justice? Insolence? Whatever it is, it will be tested. And this is what is keeping me from choosing it. Be warned, this is a demanding ambition best played by a lineage that has already completed wealth or fame. Yeah, so the truth is most interesting to me, but it specifically warns me not to choose it if I haven't already played through as one of these others. But you know what? I just had a sudden change of heart. I'm gonna do the truth. Yeah, it's a demanding ambition best played by a lineage that has already completed wealth or fame. You know what, I played the original Sunless Seas for 60 hours. I've played Dark Souls, right? I mean, this couldn't be harder than Dark Souls, right? I mean, even if I don't get the truth, that can be interesting in and of itself, right? Even if I fail to get the truth, that could be an interesting character arc. Depending on how much I roleplay. Let's do it. I'm gonna do it. Right, now we get to customize our character, the appearance, term of address, and our name. For the term of address, I went with comrade, because that feels appropriate since we're a revolutionary. And as it says here, this will determine what people call your captain, but your captain's gender is up to you. Which I really appreciate that, that's really cool. And actually reminds me that just a few days ago I saw a Twitter thread, which I guess if, hopefully I'll remember and I'll try to link it in the description of the video. There's a Twitter thread from one of the developers of this game talking about how they consulted with a bunch of different groups of people. Like, I think they consulted with someone on, like, trans characters and gender and things like that. I think they consulted with somebody on either colonialism or imperialism. And I thought that was really good, and that's just, you know, that's the way to do it. If you're writing about something that you don't have a lot of experience with, and it's something that is pretty unstable territory, you know, I mean, talking about marginalized groups of people, if you write about that in a very bad way, that could do real actual harm because they're a, you know, marginalized group of people who are pretty vulnerable. So when you're wading into really unstable territory like that, hire people to consult with you. The name I'm going to go with is Elizabeth, named after Elizabeth Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. My wife actually came up with a name. So we have Pride and Prejudice crossed with Overturning Capitalism. Comrade Elizabeth. <laughs> I love it. Right, this is a summary of everything we've got. Revolutionary, who did it with our mind. We're seeking the truth. Our name is Elizabeth, and we look like that. So the starting stats for things that you didn't put any special points into is, is just 10. 10 iron, 10 heart. Our biggest skill is Veil, which we have 25 of. Second biggest is 17 Mirror for all the stuff that we did with academia and research and things like that. Yeah, your arguments found receptive ears. They were cited amongst Firebrand students and graced the hastily printed pages of subversive pamphlets. Start game. <laughs>